the surface lies the hidden world of the deep sea, a world filled with creatures weird and wonderful. Hello, I'm Peter Benchley. Nearly three quarters of our planet is unknown to us, for it is covered by water that is, on average, more than two miles deep. If you could magically drain all the water off the planet and look at the ocean floor, you would see a forbidding land of towering mountains, endless plains, and steep chasms. In this program, we'll take you where few, if any, people have ever been, into the heart of the deep, the dark and sunless sea. Our journey begins here in Bermuda on a postcard perfect day in late August. We've chosen Bermuda because of its unique geography. Most ports in the North Atlantic are situated on continental shelves, making the journey to deep water long and arduous. But Bermuda is different. The island of Bermuda is basically the tip of a very steep mountain most of which is underwater. Measured from the sea floor, this mountain is about 4,500 meters, or almost three miles high, taller than many peaks in the Colorado Rockies. Setting off from this mountaintop, we will reach deep water in less than an hour. The captain of the Miss Wendy is Teddy Tucker, a native of Bermuda and an encyclopedia of the sea. Teddy has spent most of his 70 plus years at sea searching for the wonders hidden below the surface. Also on board are Greg Stone, director of conservation for the New England Aquarium, and John Veeley, master diver. Teddy keeps an eye on the sonar. The sonar measures the distance from the boat to the ocean floor by sending out an audio signal and measuring the time it takes to be reflected back to the boat. The sonar indicates that we're now in waters 800 meters, or half a mile deep. Teddy cuts the engine and we drop anchor. All about us, we can see nothing but water and sky. We have entered the pelagic zone, the name scientists give to the vast expanse of open ocean. I mean, right down and throw the net up. In his years of exploring the deep waters off Bermuda, Teddy has devised a simple technique for finding out what swims below his boat. Using a net, a jar, and one very long rope. Chuck out clear. Okay. The net acts as a funnel to lure creatures to the jar, which has a small amount of bait inside. Jar and net will sink all the way to the sea floor. Well, it's going down about 400 fathoms, which is 2,400 feet, and it's. And it's blacker than inside a Barney's cow. Good and black. That's another 200 gone. 1,200 feet and falling. It's hard to imagine how different the environment is where our net is headed. Up here, we're basking in the sun. At 400 fathoms, it's perpetual night. Up here, the temperature is tropical. At 400 fathoms, the water's closer to freezing. Up here, we take no notice of atmospheric pressure. At 400 fathoms, the pressure is strong enough to crush our lungs. 
Though the deep sea seems like another planet, it is hardly immune from human actions. Nets a thousand times larger than the one we're using have scoured the seas in an epidemic of overfishing. Yeah, over the years out here, I've seen a tremendous change. The sharks have disappeared. You don't see the amount of tuna fish and the jacks and stuff that used to be out here in the open ocean. Well, I've fished out. Hey, that's it. We'll see what we catch in an hour and a half. and round with the flipping great wheel. <laughs> there it is, my quad look at it. <laughs> now, come over here and take hold of it. The jar is filled with tiny organisms like shrimp, copepods, and arrow worms, plus one fish a snapper named for its glassy eyes. It is a real deep water creature. For centuries, human knowledge of the deep sea was limited to what we could pull up using nets and jars. Bermuda's deep waters were the testing ground for one of the very first attempts to put a human being into inner space. This is a bathysphere made of steel and barely large enough to fit two grown men. Right here off the coast of Bermuda, the first humans ever to see the deep firsthand made their historic voyage. In 1934, the New York Zoological Society sponsored an expedition to explore the deep with the help of the National Geographic Society. Biologist William Beebe and engineer Otis Barton plunged more than 800 meters or nearly half a mile into the sea and returned to tell the tale. Attempts to take photographs from the bathysphere failed, but Beebe was able to describe what he saw to artist Elsa Bostelman. Her illustrations captured this historic event, depicting sea creatures never before seen in their natural environment. Despite the revolution in exploration launched by Beebe, most of the deep sea is still unexplored. Marine scientists are at the beginning of a great adventure to reveal this unknown world. In 1960, advances in submarine technology made it possible for two men, Jacques Picard and Don Walsh in the Trieste, to reach the deepest part of the ocean floor, the Marianas Trench in the North Pacific. They went down nearly 11,000 meters, or seven miles. If you took Mount Everest and put it inside the trench, the summit would be more than a mile below the surface. Only 1% of the world's oceans has actually been seen by human eyes. One way scientists are expanding their vision is through the use of remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs, like this one, operated by the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. As the ROV moves through the water column, it sends back video images to the scientists in the control room. The ROV can also collect data about temperature, water chemistry, and currents. The deeper you go, the weirder it gets. These deep water species look positively ferocious. Take this anglerfish. Its elastic stomach allows it to eat prey larger than itself. 
Or this hatchet fish with its huge Darth Vader-like eyes drinking up all the available light. Though they look terrifying, most of these deep water species are small. Many of these fish grow no bigger than a human hand. Since food is scarce down here, the predators will often wait in ambush for a passing victim, rather than using energy to chase prey. Submersibles have opened an entirely new window on the deep sea. In Bermuda, scientists are looking at the behavior of one of the lords of the deep, the six-gill shark. Six-gills eat a wide range of food, from crabs to squid to shrimp, even dolphins. They can grow to be as long as a station wagon and often can be found swimming along the sea floor at depths of up to 2,500 meters. To help cope with the darkness, these deep sea sharks have eyes that are twice as effective as a cat's. And like other sharks, six gills use their jaws like vice grips to attack prey and battle competitors. In the darkness of the deep, scientists from the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute witness nature's own fireworks display. Some deep sea animals are adapted to reflect light, making them look like rainbow-colored neon signs moving through the water. Other animals are actually able to create their own light, a phenomenon called bioluminescence. Bioluminescence on land is rare. Fireflies have it, as do a few earthworms and centipedes. But in the ocean, bioluminescence is widespread, and it's a useful tool for creatures that spend most of their time in the dark. There are many ways deep-sea creatures use their bioluminescence. One way is to get food, like this anglerfish filmed in a laboratory. In front of its mouth, it dangles a glowing appendage that acts like a fishing rod, luring unsuspecting prey. Another way is to attract a mate. These flashlight fish signal to one another, letting it be known that they are ready to reproduce. A third way is as a defense. This black dragonfish can outmaneuver its predators by turning its lights on and off. The predator moves toward the light, which the dragonfish then turns off and in the darkness swims away. Many fish see through what could be called yellow sunglasses, lenses that filter out 80% of the blue light that reaches the eye. These lenses actually increase the contrast between light coming from bioluminescent creatures and the blue background light from penetrating sunlight. So if I had the eyes of, say, an anglerfish, this is what these trees would look like to me. For centuries, scientists thought that little could survive in the high-pressure, cold-temperature, low-light world of the sea floor. But the advent of deep-sea exploration is proving just how wrong they were. 
One surprise has been the discovery of large and diverse deep sea coral reefs all around the world. You usually think of coral in shallow, warm waters in the tropics. But most deep sea corals flourish in cold water, some even as deep as a mile below the surface. These reefs are an important habitat for many deep sea organisms. Throughout the world's oceans, deep sea coral oases rival the diversity of species found in tropical rainforests. On Lophelia reefs, more than 700 different species of sea creatures have been identified. Yet, just like the rainforest, these rich ecosystems are being threatened by human actions. Many deep sea coral reefs have inadvertently been destroyed by heavy fishing trawls that scour the sea floor and crush the coral. And in the Pacific, overfishing is threatening the survival of the orange roughy. These brightly colored fish are renowned for living more than a hundred years. The orange roughy fishery only began in 1978. But in less than 25 years, the impact has been devastating. Today, off New Zealand and Australia, scientists estimate that as little as 10 to 20 percent of the original population remains. Submarine technology is transforming our knowledge of the deep sea. Like the Alvin, operated by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, submersibles are the starships of inner space, boldly going where no one has gone before. In the 1970s, scientists on the Alvin made a mind-boggling discovery, underwater geysers called hydrothermal vents. The boiling point of water in these vents is three times hotter than at sea level. Yet to their amazement, scientists have found numerous species of life thriving around the vents, including these giant tube worms. Proposals to mine these hydrothermal vents for minerals such as copper and zinc pose a threat to these rare and fragile ecosystems. These hot vents may one day provide clues to the origins of life, not only on our planet, but in the entire solar system. Up till now, most scientists thought all life in the oceans depended on photosynthesis, the transformation of sunlight into energy. But at the vents, they discovered a food chain that doesn't need sunlight. Instead, it's built on a bacteria that survive using chemosynthesis, transforming hydrogen sulfide in the vents into a source of energy. The discovery astounded biologists and triggered a new approach to the search for life in outer space. And now scientists have discovered that one of Jupiter's moons, Europa, is likely to contain an immense ocean of salty water. And one intriguing possibility is that Europa's ocean may contain some kind of hydrothermal life. The surface of Europa is covered with a thick layer of ice, scarred by ridges and fractures. Scientists believe that beneath this icy crust may lurk an ocean similar to our own. One of NASA's highest priorities is to design a probe that will test this hypothesis by breaking through the ice to discover what's below. If it is an ocean, there's a chance that there might be some kind of hydrothermal vent on Europa's sea floor. And 
where there are vents, there just might be life. Advances in technology have made the deep sea more accessible than ever before. But for even your ordinary scuba diver, there is still a way to see the creatures of the deep firsthand. In the middle of the night, in the middle of the ocean. At two o'clock in the morning, Teddy uses a spotlight to lure sea creatures to the boat. Like Teddy's trick with the net, this simple tool often produces surprising results. Tonight, Teddy's attracted something he's never seen before, a school of flying fish getting ready to spawn. Oh. It appears that the female flying fish are changing color right before our eyes. We can see three white stripes appear on their bodies. I think this is uh, quite extraordinary. And it just goes to show that if you put yourself in new places at new times and new situations in the ocean, you can learn new things uh, quite easily. Night dives in the open ocean are not for the faint of heart. You never know what lurks just beyond the reach of your flashlight. And John, the Makos, usually you don't have to worry about them because by the time you see them, they're already on you. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go in, John, until you get in and t make sure it's safe in there, okay? Reach for your foot and it's gone and you think, so did I forget that too? Adieu. Suspended in the water, my only point of reference is a rope dangling from the boat, a lifeline to which I cling. Below, I can see our lights being consumed by the utter blackness. This must be what it's like to be an astronaut, the same sense of weightlessness and unending space. Yet, unlike outer space, inner space is not devoid of life, but filled with it. The flying fish are even more magical underwater than above. Greg is able to follow one closely with his video camera. Suddenly, we are surrounded by tiny juvenile octopuses, no bigger than my thumb. In the water around us, we see literally hundreds of these octopuses, including one that decides to investigate the surface of Greg's scuba mask. And to our great surprise, we spot a paper nautilus attached to a pelagic jellyfish. There is no record of this ever having been seen before. It appears that the paper nautilus is towing the poisonous jellyfish through the water column to protect itself from predators. At this very moment, we are witnessing the greatest animal migration on Earth. Few people realize that this migration happens every single night, and it happens right here in the oceans. Beginning just after sunset, animals that live deep in the water column move toward the surface in order to feed under the protective cover of darkness. Then, before the sun rises, these migrators will descend once more into the depths.
These dark waters are the last great wilderness left on planet Earth. But this wilderness, like those on land, is threatened. Overfishing, pollution, global warming, all are taking their toll. Our stewardship is needed to ensure a healthy future for the creatures of the deep. The air in our scuba tanks is getting low. With regret, we begin our ascent back to the boat. Like our dive, our acquaintance with the deep sea has been tantalizingly brief. So much is still unknown. Since 1960, hundreds of people have reached the summit of Mount Everest. More than a dozen astronauts have touched the surface of the moon, but only two men have reached the deepest part of the ocean. We have spent billions on space exploration, but relatively only pennies to explore the 70% of our planet that lies beneath the sea. This new millennium gives us a great opportunity to discover what wonders may await us beyond this final frontier.